Um, in terms of, of the question that Sister Rolda asked, my interest in family ministries, um, in addition to family, one of my, my, my other interests is, is emotional well-being. Um, and I guess that stems from my growing up experience, because when I was um, when I was young, I, I was very, very shy, very shy. And, and that was one of the obstacles that kind of prevented me from coming into the church. It was a, it was a long, painful journey for me to to join the church. And, and particularly because that Hampstead, which was the church I, I um, was baptized into, was, was a very large church at the time. Uh, so many people. And it was a real struggle for me to to get to the point where I felt comfortable. Um, so this theme of emotional well-being has, has always been uh, something that I've had an interest in. And that's kind of what I want to touch on this evening, because the experience of fear is one of the greatest obstacles that gets in the way of our, our thriving in, in our spiritual life and in every aspect of life. So we can look at the, the other side of, of fear. Um, let me begin by setting the scene. Um, Numbers chapter 13, we have the story of the, the 12 spies. And um, when you read the account in the book of Numbers, God leads the children of Israel to the very borders of the promised land, to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And when you read the account in Numbers, it appears that, that, that it was God's idea to send these spies into the land. But when you read uh, parallel like, accounts, I think in the, in the, in the book of, of Deuteronomy, we actually see that this was an idea that was born in the minds of the people. And God simply said, okay, if you're going to send spies into the land, this is how I want you to do it. Choose of the, uh, the, the, the leaders. And so these, these 12 tribal leaders go into the promised land. And the reason why they, they, they wanted to do it that way is because they wanted to make sure that things were as God said they would be. Um, because of their fear. And so spies go into the land. People have this great sense of anticipation. Spies return after 40 days and, and things appear to, to be well. These spies bring back evidence that the land is, is a fruitful land um, and they begin to, to give their report. But as they continue in their report, um, the atmosphere begins to change because these 12 spies start speaking about the, the giants in the land. And, and all of a sudden, these people can see the, the, the walled chariots and the, 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 sorry, the walled cities and iron chariots. And, 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 and the more they speak, the more fearful the people get. Caleb and Joshua try to still the people and to encourage them. But in the, in the end, fear wins out. And the, the people said, the spies said, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So, so God prepared everything for them. Everything was ready. He'd made provision for them. And yet they did not enter into the promised land. Why? Because of fear. So let's talk about fear this evening. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States of America, he was appointed to become president in 1933. This was in the aftermath of the Great Depression. So when he became president, it, it was, it was a, a challenging time. Uh, people were fearful about the future. There was a lot of poverty uh, around. And, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he gave his inaugural address, he spoke to the mood of the time, and, and this is what he said. He said, so first let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes the needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Now, Roosevelt knew that the people were, were facing real challenges in terms of building the economy back and, 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 and going forward, uh, building up the nation again. He, he was aware that there were challenges, but he also knew 
that the, the main thing that would hold people back was not the reality of the challenges, but fear itself. And, and that's kind of reflected in the experience of the children of Israel. God knew that there were giants in the land, and yet he made provision. He knew that what would hold them back was not the obstacles, because he had already shown them that he could overcome obstacles. What would hold them back was their fear. Now, 9-11. Um, after 9-11, there, there was a dynamic that occurred. People became very fearful about getting into uh, to airplanes. And so what we saw was that the, the mass numbers uh, decided that they weren't going to fly and they started to drive rather than, than fly. And so what we saw was that the year after the 9-11, the statistics for deaths on the road rose to unprecedented numbers that leveled off um, after about a year, when people started to drift back to the airlines. And, and the research that was done showed that, that the most dangerous part of an airplane journey is actually the drive to the airport. Um, now, what the evidence, what, what the research also showed was that the safest time in the whole history of, of, of uh, commercial uh, airlines, the safest time to fly was actually immediately after 9-11. Why? Because of all the security that was put in place. So thousands of people died on the roads. Why? Because of nameless, irrational, fears about what would take place if they did fly. Now, uh, Gandhi said this, fear has its use, but cowardice has none. Fear has its use, but cowardice has none. So fear is not necessarily a bad thing. It is an emotion that is designed to prepare us to face a real or perceived danger. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, it was never his intention that they would ever experience fear. Uh, fear was a result of the sin which, which they committed. Um, but Adam and Eve and us, we have built within us the capacity to, to be fearful. So is fear a bad thing? Well, let's, let's unpack that. Samuel Johnson was an English uh, writer, playwright, poet. He said this, fear may serve as a preservative from evil, but its duty, like that of other passions, is not to overbear reason, but to assist it, nor should it be suffered to tyrannize in the imagination, to raise phantoms of horror, or beset life with distresses. Now, uh, when, I, when I read that, it reminded me of, of an experience I had when I was at school. Now, I went to an all boys school and we, we used to go camping every year. We'd go camping to the same place, a place called Leith Hill. Now, Leith Hill had a reputation for being haunted. So there we are camping at the base of, of, of this reputedly haunted hill. And you know how, how boys are. We, we, we would challenge each other and somebody challenged us to go for a midnight walk up this reputedly um, haunted hill. So there we are, guys together, walking up this, um, this hill in the dead of night. Couldn't see much in, in, in front of you. Um, and, we're, and we're getting on up to all kinds of hijinks, jumping out behind bushes, making scary noises. And, and all of a sudden there was a guy with us. His name was Anderson. Um, little guy and it, you could see his face now freckle face guy glasses and and all of a sudden anderson stopped in his tracks and, it, and, and, he, and, he, and he's leaning forward as he's trying to see through the darkness and all of a sudden he lets out this 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 blood curdling scream and immediately takes off back down the hill Funny enough, he had this Coke can in his hand, a full Coke can. And as he ran, he threw that thing about 30 feet up in the air and he was gone. 
Now, when he screamed, that spooked the rest of us. And we took off after him. Now, now while Anderson had a head start on us, trust me, he was not the first one back down the hill. So, so here we are, a bunch of guys flying down this hill, running from the ghosts and the ghouls and the axe-wielding serial killers that we had conjured up in our imagination. Flying down this hill because of fear and fear alone. And this is what, what, what uh, Johnson was talking about. We should not allow our fear to tyrannize in the imagination and raise phantoms of horror that, that beset life with distresses. Now, now um, there is a, a, a negative way of thinking that is called catastrophizing. Um, it's identified in cognitive behavioral therapy. Catastrophizing is this tendency to look for the worst case scenario in, in any given situation. And it can really shackle us in terms of, of uh, progressing in life. Uh, you may have come across this um, um, acrostic before. Fear, uh, fear is false evidence appearing real. It's all about what we conjure up in our imagination. Now, um, I was flying out to Andrews University uh, and on the plane, they were playing the, these movies. I, I was tired. I, I didn't have the, the, the concentration to read. And so I ended up watching this, this movie. It's called After Earth. Will Smith and, and his son, Jaden, uh, were the stars. Um, really rubbish film. But but it, the premise of the film was that uh, we have to overcome fear, and that was, there were these monsters, and these monsters could could sense fear, and so in order to survive, you had to you had to just get rid of all fear. Um, and as I say, it was it was a rubbish film, but there was a state there was a statement in it that was made by the lead character. Um, his name was Cipher Rage, uh, which which struck me. And, and this is a statement that the only place that fear can exist is in the thoughts of our future. It is a product of our imagination causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. And I'm sure that we can all think about experiences that we have had where we have been confronted with with, with things that are going to happen in the future and we're worrying about it sometimes we worry ourselves sick and and in the end there is no real purpose or no real point for us to be worrying I think we can all think about experiences like that I can think of many and we end up thinking to ourselves well why did I put myself through all of that stress um so fear can have a a, a positive purpose but it can also tyrannize us um, and, and also prevent us from, from moving forward with our goals. Uh, Mark Twain said this, he said, I've lived through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> I'm sure we can, can resonate uh, with that statement. Now, here's a random list, uh, a very random list. Jealousy, greed, anger, addiction, chronic lateness, talking too much, talking too little, overeating, aggression, depression, aloofness, the need for the limelight, workaholism. I mean, you can see the list there. Now, now, all of these things can have their roots in, in fear. So, so um, fear is what is described as, as, as a primary emotion. And fear is often masked by other emotions that we experience. And sometimes when we engage in, in some of these, these uh, behaviors and these thought patterns, we don't actually recognize that that fear is at its root. And so we need to do some, some introspection to, to kind of understand what is motivating us to do the things uh, that we do. Now, not only can fear hold us back in life, but fear, but but the, the way we relate to fear can have eternal consequences. If you read in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, um, that text identifies various things that will that will cause people to be lost. It identifies unbelieving, 
murders, um, whoremongering, sorcery, um, idolatry, lying. And among that list, it states that, that those who will be lost are the fearful, the fearful. Now, when I when I read that, it, it, it kind of tweaked tweaked my my curiosity. Why would people be lost because of fear? I mean, is 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 is, is it sinful to be fearful? Well, the answer to that is, it depends why you're fearful, and it depends on the type of fear that you are experiencing. Now, now we are born with with some innate fears. There's the fear of loud noises, uh, the fear of falling, and the fear of abandonment. These are the fears that, that the babies have innately. All of the fears that we have are learned. Now, if they are learned, they can also be unlearned. There is no fear that we experience that we cannot overcome. Winston Churchill said this. He said, you may take the most gallant sailor the most intrepid airman or the most audacious soldier, put them at a table together, what do you get? The sum of their fears. Now, what Churchill was communicating was that courage and fear are not mutually exclusive. In fact, you cannot be courageous unless you first experience fear. Because if you're not fearful, you don't need courage. Um, Jesus himself, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, experienced fear. If you read in, in the, the book Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, there is a chapter in there. I highly recommend you read it. Powerful chapter um, called The Suffering of, of Christ. And it talks about how, how Jesus was, was tempted to fear that he would not come through the portal of the tomb. Um, so Jesus ex experienced fear in the Garden of Gethsemane because of the weight of the sins of the world pressing down on him and for the distance it was putting between himself and his father. But, but here is uh, a truth that we need to appreciate, that courage is not the absence of fear. It is a positive response to fear. Um, there is a saying that goes that, that, that courage is speaking the truth even if your voice shakes. I like that. So, so um, you know, in the movies, they kind of portray fear as this kind of bravado and I am, you know, there is nothing that can phase me type fear to type courage. But no, that's not what courage is all about. Courage is about recognizing the, the, the fears that we are experiencing and pressing forward anyhow. So, Fear can rob us of the abundant life and shackle our potential for God. Now, in Revelation 21 and verse 8, in that passage where it talks about um, fear, the fearful being lost, uh, I went and did some, some digging, did some research to find out what, what this, this actually means. Uh, and the word there for fear is, is um, delos, and delos means to be timid or to be faithless. It is to have the spirit of slavish fear, uh, who through fear of man are not bold for God or to draw back. And this is what, what we see in, um, in Numbers 13 with the children of Israel. They did not trust God. They, they, they had a fear. And as a result of that fear, they, they drew back from the task that God had set before them. Now, there is a difference between having fears and fear having us. Fear is a, is a natural human emotion that we will experience. And there is a reason why God continually says to us, uh, fear not, fear not, fear not, because he knows that we will experience fear. That's not the problem. The problem is that when we allow our fears to take control of us. Now, one of the ways that our fears can hinder our progress through life is, is procrastination. Um, I read a book on procrastination because I, I must admit, um, I, I am guilty of, of procrastination. Um, um, it was something that, that, that kind of became a habit when I was a child. And when I was going through college, it, it was a habit 
um, I would write my papers last minute and get get decent results. I always end up kicking myself because thinking if, if I had just started earlier, I could have gotten even better grade. Um, and I got into the habit of procrastination. So I read this book and to, to try and overcome this, this dynamic of procrastination. And it came up with some, some interesting um, suggestions as to why people procrastinate. And it suggested that one of the reasons why we procrastinate is because of the fear of failure. And the rationale behind it is that if, if we procrastinate, and then we don't succeed at a task, we, we, we don't have to put it down to the fact that we were not up to the task. We can rationalize it and say that, oh, well, it was because I didn't really prepare properly. And it's a kind of defense mechanism to um, avoid the, the, the reality that we might not be up to, to certain tasks or, certain, or have certain abilities. But the, 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 as I was, continued reading this book, it came up with another suggestion as to why we might procrastinate. And that one really pricked my, my attention. Um, it suggested that we may procrastinate because of the fear of success. Sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Uh, why would we fear success? Surely we all want to be um, successful. Um, but what suggested was that the fear of success is actually a close cousin to the fear of failure because it is often rooted in the belief that success in one area of life will lead to difficulties in another area of life. So there is this basic fear that if, if, if things go well here, then it's going to lead to something which, which, which will go badly later on. Um, it's called the, the fear of foreboding. That even if things are going well now, there is this nagging sense that, that in the future, things are going to, to fall apart. And that, that one really did um, intrigue me. Now, um, there's a lady called Brene Brown. She's now a very uh, popular um, speaker. And um, she gave a TED Talk. Um, and in this TED Talk, she spoke about the power of vulnerability. And uh, when she was talking about this TED Talk, she said something really, really interesting. She said that when the TED Talk went out, she expected maybe it would get a few hundred views on, on YouTube or something like that. Um, but the, but the, 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 the talk went viral. And eventually it hit a million views. And she, and she said, when it hit a million, her, her shame response kicked in. And she said that, that it was a strange, because she wanted to be successful. That's what she said. She said, while I wanted to be successful, I also wanted to remain small. And it's kind of linked to uh, this this idea of the the fear of the fear of success, what it's going to expose us to. Uh, she wanted to to be successful, but she also wanted to remain small. Um, now, I remember watching a movie. The movie was called uh, Coach Carter. Oh, oh, by the way, I share this with you. When Brene Brown said that, it kind of resonated with me. Um, I have mentioned that I did a doctorate um, um, a while back in, in family ministry. And um, in order to do the doctorate, you have to have a, 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 like a tutor. And, and um, I went to see my, my, my advisor. And uh, when I shared with him what I was going to be doing my doctorate on, at first he wasn't very interested. But then when I unpacked where, what I wanted to do with it, um, he got excited. And so we had this great conversation. At the end of the conversation, he said to me, do you know, when you finish this doctorate, you will be the expert in this field. Now, when he said that, it immediately, rather than, than give me a sense of encouragement and, and, and um, give me a, a, a buzz, it actually struck a chord in me that, that made me a bit fearful. 
Um, because when you are the expert, you become the go-to person. When you become the expert, and I'm not sure that I believe in the concept of experts, but but when you become knowledgeable in a particular area, there is no hiding place. You become the go-to person. And, and And when I thought about that, this statement that Brene Brown kind of resonated with me because while I wanted to want to be successful because of my character, my personality, I also wanted to remain small. Now, and again, that's about the fear of success. So um, I watched a movie called Coach Carter. Uh, coach Carter was about a basketball coach who had responsibility to um, to uh, educate a, a, a group of, of students, and and he he set them real challenges. He said that if you want to play basketball, then you have to maintain a grade point average at, at a certain level. And um, and in this film, uh, there was a young man who who was thrown off the team because he wasn't cooperating. But then he, he pled to that that he would be received back. And, uh, and when Coach Carter refused to take him back, he, he recited um, a, a, a poem. And, uh, and when I heard the poem, it made me curious. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to find out if the poem was, was written for the, the film or did it come from somewhere else? So I did a little digging. And I'm glad I did because when I eventually found the, the original, and what it showed me was that the, the the statement that was made or the poem that was recited in the film took out God references that were in the original. Uh, and, and here is a statement. Now, I don't necessarily believe everything that it says within it, but it makes some, some very important points. It said this, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel secure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Amen. It's Amen. A powerful thoughts, powerful ideas in there. And that last statement kind of it reminded me of of David's experience, you know, when he see, when he killed the Goliath. Before he killed Goliath, the children of Israel were, were were paralyzed with fear. But as soon as David killed Goliath, as soon as he demonstrated courage, as soon as he um, was liberated um, from from any kinds of of, of intimidation uh, from Goliath. The children of Israel, all of a sudden, they plucked up the courage to go and, and, and wipe out the Philistines. So, so our overcoming fear can actually have the impact of liberating others to overcome their own fears too. So there is no heavier burden than an unf unfilled potential. Procrastination allows us to avoid the responsibility that goes along with fulfilling our potential. There are so many people in history who could have been great, but they allowed themselves to be uh, shackled. They, they did not fulfill their potential for one reason or another, and as a result, didn't become as great as they could have been. Um, Pastor Ron Surridge, he was uh, one of my lecturers when I was at, at Newbold College. Um, lovely man, lovely man. Uh, I did a preaching class with him. And he gave a sermon at Newbold College in which he described or gave a definition of success. And I share that with you. He said, success is to find your place 
and to fill it. Success is to find your place and to fill it. So, so when it comes to, to being courageous, God gives us different gifts. We all have different responsibilities, different um, abilities. And it's not, not everybody has to be up front. Not everybody has to, to, to do certain types of tasks. The most important thing is that we recognize what our giftedness is, and then we, we give our best to fulfill the potential that we have uh, within us to fulfill, uh, to, to, uh, to fulfill that ability or to, to practice that ability. Nelson Mandela said this. He said, there is no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of, of living. Another saying says this, for all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest of these it might have been. One of the saddest things in life is to, to look, at, look at people who look back on their life and it's all about regrets and all about what they should have done. It's, it's a shoulds and oughts and um, it's life is short. <laughs> life is really short. And so we have a, we have a, a, a brief time to fulfill the, the potential that God has placed um, within us. Uh, lost opportunities, it's, it's, it's really a really sad thing to, to see. Um, Feel the fear and do it anyway. That's what courage is all about. We experience the fear, but we do it anyway. Every time we choose safety over courage, we reinforce our fears. The only way to be courageous is to be courageous. There is no shortcut. It is exactly that. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Uh, it was Jack Canfield, who was uh, a, a business entrepreneur, who made the statement, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Fear is one of the, the, the most mm. powerful weapons that the enemy will, will wield in order to prevent us from fulfilling the potential that God has placed within us. But if we would just take courage and press through those fears, uh, we will experience untold success uh, in God. First John chapter 4 verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears or he who, become, or he who becomes a slave to fear has not been made perfect in love. So the key to overcoming fear is to develop our relationship with God. It is to, it is to allow God to saturate our hearts um, with his love. Uh, St. Augustine said this, untie by love the knot you tied about yourself through fear. Uh, David prayed this in Psalm uh, 139. He said, search me, O God and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When we think about courage and, and we think about David, we often think about, you know, the, the Goliath and we think about the, you know, the lion and the bear and all those courageous things that David did, the victories that he won on the battlefield but david was at his most courageous when he prayed this prayer search me oh god one of the most courageous things we will ever do is to open our hearts to god this was david coming before god and saying lord search my heart see if there is anything in me that is unlike you and if there is anything there remove it from me one of the most courageous things that we will ever do is to allow God full access into our hearts. And similarly, one of the most courageous things we will ever do in our relationships is to allow people access into our hearts in our most intimate relationships. Because even in, in, in our marriages and in our, in our parenting, 
fear can devastate our, our, our relationships. We need to get to a place where we can feel safe enough to, to open our hearts to one another. And that's, that's a courageous act that we can do to, to lay it all um, out there, to lay ourselves naked before one another. The children of Israel. It is not that the Israelites did not believe God, that, or did not believe that God could save them. Their problem was they didn't trust that he would. Think about this for a moment. The children of Israel saw the ten plagues. The children of Israel saw God open up the red, they walked through the Red Sea for crying out loud. It wasn't that they did not know God's power. It wasn't that they didn't think he had the ability to give them victory over the giants in the land. They simply didn't trust that he would. Why? Because they didn't know him. Mm -hmm. They didn't know him. Amen. Because if they knew him, they would, tr they would have trusted him. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If we know him, then we will believe him when he tells us that. If we know him, we will trust him when he says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. If we know him and trust him, we will believe him when he says, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But we got to know him. So, what would you do? What would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? What would it be? Maybe that's the thing that God wants you to strive for. Maybe that's the dream that he has put within your heart that he wants you to fulfill. Maybe that's the thing that, 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 is, uh, that, that something is holding you back from. So, so what is your promised land? What is it that God is calling you to that fear is holding you back from? Is it a relationship? Is it a change of career? What is it that God has placed within your heart, that, 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 that dream that he wants you to fulfill? Caleb and Joshua, when they were faced with the challenge of going into the promised land, when the spies were saying, no, we cannot do this for they are greater than, than we are. We are grasshoppers. Caleb and Joshua were the ones who were saying, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. And that was based not on their confidence in their own abilities. That was based in their complete, total trust in the God who had given them victories in the past, and they believed that he would give them victory in the future. Romans chapter 8 says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. What Paul is telling us here is that our ability to be overcomers, to live a spirit-filled life, is rooted in the belief that God is our Father. That God is our Father. Let me leave you with this. This is a, a poem written by a lady called Dorna Markova. And she says this, um, I will not die an unlived life. I will not live to live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it become a wing, a torch, a promise. I choose to risk 
my significance. To live so that that which came to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. May this be our determination and our experience in Jesus' name.